Brooke Chaplin. And coming up next on WVU News, I'll tell you about the West Virginia Innocence Project fighting for those in prison. Did you know that West Virginia is thinking about changing its homeschooling policies? I'm Tristan Webster, and coming up next on WVU News, I'll tell you what one local family thinks about the new changes. Right to work is coming to the Mountain State. I'm to go to Hoover and straight ahead, I'll tell you what that can mean for West Virginia's workers. Our Emmy Award winning WVU News starts now. There are more people being convicted of crimes they didn't commit than ever before. We'll tell you about an organization that is trying to free the innocent. I'm Keith Willis. And I'm Brooke Chaplin. The passing of a new right to work law is causing some major uproar here in the Mountain State. These stories and more on WVU News, an Emmy award winning newscast produced by television journalism students right here at West Virginia University. West Virginia's legislative session is well underway and new laws are being passed every day. Among them is the controversial right to work law. That's right, Brooke. And as many union members are a fear at loss of membership, benefits and wages with this new law. Reporter Dakota Hoover has more on workers' concerns here in West Virginia. Dakota? Thanks, Keith and Brooke. States that are considered right to work eligible prohibit companies from requiring employees to pay union dues as a condition of employment. The passage of right to work in West Virginia means the business labor landscape is changing and protesters recently gathered here in Morgantown to voice their opinions on the new rule. I was able to attend the rally against the bill. The mountain lair was the site of a recent protest against the state legislature's passing of a bill to make West Virginia the 26th right to work state. Eight of the top ten states with the lowest wages are right-to-work states, and uh, workplace injuries, especially fatalities, are much higher in right-to-work states. And so I, I, I pray that doesn't happen to our hard-working men and women, but it, it very likely could. Right-to-work protesters have gathered here in Morgantown to battle the cold and have their voices heard. Among their concerns are weakened union memberships, lower wages, and free riders that will benefit from unions without paying their dues. Union membership in the United States has dropped from 30% to 11% since the 1950s. Some feel the laws are unnecessary because there is already similar legislation federally. They Basically, it's reiterating an old law from 1935 from the National Labor Relations Act. Um, their, their statement is that uh, no one can be forced to join a union. Well, the federal law already states you can't be forced to join a union. Union members fear the bill will have negative consequences on their associations. Well, absolutely what this, th these laws are clearly intended to do are to demolish unions. Proponents of the law claim more jobs will be added as a result, but those opposed are doubtful. You tend to have a lot of out-of-state companies that will come in, they'll underbid. Sometimes their work isn't as good and they bring workers with them, which means that West Virginians aren't being put to work. It's people coming here from other places and taking jobs that could have been ours. Around 50 protesters came out to join the rally, including teachers, construction workers, plumbers, and hospital workers. Governor Earl Ray Tomlin's attempt to stop the law was blocked as Senate and House Republicans used their majority to override his veto. The new law will go into effect sometime this summer. Keith and Brooke, back to you. Thanks, Dakota. And while one group is rallying against the new law, another is trying to fight for those who have been convicted in the courtroom. And Keith's studies show that DNA testing is only possible in 10% of criminal cases, which means science can't always clear innocent people. I learned more about an organization that is working to end wrongful convictions in West Virginia. Then yes. The chain could go on for a Since the early 2000s, the West Virginia Innocence Project has aimed to end the cycle of wrongful imprisonment. And WVU law professor Robert Bastris says that the project is necessary to expose problems. The importance of the project is that it works to correct mistakes made by our criminal justice system. And we're finding out now <laughs> that... Uh, that's not all that uncommon for that to occur. According to a national registry, 2014 marked the highest year for proven wrongful convictions, and these problems with the criminal justice system are still of national concern. Research shows that in courtrooms like this, nearly 5% of U.S. criminals are wrongfully accused. That means more than 20,000 innocent people are behind bars. The Innocence Project is set up for third-year WVU law students to work on cases under supervision. Director of the project Valina Beatty says that everyone involved is dedicated to policy reform. We've been able to take steps even in this state to make sure that eyewitness identifications are more reliable, to, to challenge uh, 
faulty forensic evidence and to look for the best evidence to prove whether someone is uh, guilty or innocent. Reading numerous books and filing countless paperwork is part of the process to help the incarcerated, but the project needs some help of its own financially. WVU has uh, been very supportive, but there's only so much they can do, so we really rely on uh, donations from people to continue to support our work. If you would like to support the West Virginia Innocence Project, check out their website to donate or volunteer. Experts say eyewitness misidentifications are the biggest cause in wrongful convictions. They have played a role in almost 70% of over 300 DNA acquittals that have occurred since the early 90s. In April, the group will argue in front of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals in hopes of getting a post-conviction hearing for one of their clients. According to the U.S. Department of Education, in the past decade, the number of kids homeschooled increased by over 60 percent. And Keith, now state lawmakers are looking to ease restrictions on homeschooled students. That's right, Brooke. Reporter Tristan Webster joins us now in the studio to tell us more about the new education bill. Tristan? Thank you, Keith and Brooke. New regulations have been proposed to change the qualifications of homeschool teachers. I got the chance to speak to a local family about what they think about the bill and why they choose to homeschool their children. Media Roy number one and Media Roy Paula and Heath Lemley live by Cheat Lake with their four children, all of whom Paula homeschools herself. We just felt they all needed to have their education tailored individually to them. And throughout homeschooling, I've realized they're all very different learners and they all have different styles. Bill 4175 expands parental freedoms for children who are homeschooled. It's made its way to the Senate, and if the bill passes into law, homeschool teachers will no longer need a high school diploma or GED. Even though one rule has been removed, homeschoolers still have to give standardized tests and submit student progress reports to the local district. Heath Lemley says the public is often misled about what homeschool families really look like. I think a lot of the uh, misperception of the public is that uh, people who homeschool are sort of uneducated and don't have degrees and uh, you know many people are just like us who, who have gone to college or are, are very knowledgeable and, and, and some are even uh, teachers. Though they learn from home, the Lemley kids have plenty of extracurriculars. Three of them are on a summer swim league, three of them play soccer, three of them right now are doing musical instruments, a fourth has yet to choose. Over 100,000 adults in West Virginia don't have a high school diploma. The new bill would give them a chance to provide their children with the education they never had. Homeschool children typically score 15 to 30 percent more points above public school students and are 25 percent more likely to go to college. Brooke and Keith, back to you. Thanks, Tristan. Congested roads and traffic problems have plagued Morgantown for years, and with the population growing nearly 15 percent since 2000, the roads are more crowded than ever. Reporter Josh Euler has more on how Morgantown residents may soon see some relief from all the traffic. Traffic from downtown to the I-79 area could be seeing some relief. The I-79 access study is gathering information to find the best alternative to the traffic problem. Tammy Richards of Westover experiences this problem nearly every day on the Westover Bridge. If the bridge is backed up, then it's backed all the way up, all the way to High Street. So sometimes you might sit there for two or three lights before you even get to the bridge, let alone get across the bridge. The Morgantown Monongalia Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MMMPO, is performing the study to find the best solution to the traffic dilemma. One option is to build a new bridge over the Mon River. Three locations have been discussed as to where the new bridge should go, one option being right here at the end of 8th Street. MMMPO board members talked about a second location that the committee believes is the most logical area to improve. The primary focus that they think should be looked at would be the 705 quarter as well as um, Mon Boulevard, including the Star City Bridge in that area. Although any potential projects are still in the planning stages, Tammy says that if taxes need to be raised, she understands that it's for the best. The working class is taxed to the point where you're almost too rich to be poor and too poor to be rich. But at the same time, if you want the town to grow, you have to help pay for it. A third option the committee is proposing is a complete overhaul of the signal system along the Monongahela Boulevard. Josh Euler, WVU News, Morgantown. Keith, WVU faculty and students have reason to be excited after being awarded a big honor. That's right, Brooke. 
Abby Lafferty joins us now from Social Square with the latest in social media and pop culture news. Abby? WVU was buzzing all over social media recently for an incredible milestone. West Virginia University is now a top tier institution for research. WVU joined the likes of universities such as John Hopkins, Duke, and Yale with this ranking as an R1 research activity school. The Carnegie classification of institutions of higher education grants R1 status to colleges that have highest research activity. The Carnegie classification includes rankings for more than 4,000 colleges in the U.S. and it's updated every five years. Along with West Virginia University, 14 other universities including Clemson and Syracuse entered the R1 category. For the first time, Brooke and Keith, back to you. Thanks, Abby. And here at WVU News, we congratulate everyone on that prestigious honor. Well, Brooke, athletes often have to overcome a lot of adversity to this love, play the sports they love. Coming up, sports reporter Jordan Kramer will introduce us to two inspiring athletes and their stories of faith, race, and basketball. I'm Jordan Kramer, and coming up, I'll tell you about two Islamic basketball players who made an impact both on and off the court. Every journey starts with a first. How will you go first? Brooke, February is recognized as Black History Month in the United States. That's right, Keith. And this year, the WVU Lamp Speaker Series brought in two former basketball stars to tell their stories. Sports anchor Jordan Kramer is here to tell us more. Jordan? Thanks, Brooke. Controversial. That's the best one-word description of NBA star Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf and NCAA women's basketball player Bilquis Abdul-Kadar's career. No matter how much these athletes excelled on the court, it was the openness and the practicing of their faith that got the most media attention. I caught up with the former basketball players during their West Virginia visit to learn a little bit more about their journey in the Islamic faith. Um, I think that my coach thought I was going to be Most there. courageous player of the NCAA Women's Tournament. First round pick in the NBA draft. Now traveling the nation as role models for younger generations in the Islamic faith. Some girls don't have anybody to look up to. I didn't have anybody to look up to. So to be in that position, I really am thankful for it. And I'm just trying to do, you know, do it to the best of my ability. Being a role model isn't always easy. On courts like this across the nation, both Mahmoud and Bill Quis often dealt with public scrutiny for openly practicing their faith. I just didn't like the, the assass trying to assassinate your character without knowing you. While Mahmoud played at the professional level, Bill Quis was stopped short due to headgear rules interfering with the Islamic practice of wearing a hijab. And then finally when I get to a place where I want to be, it's, it stops because of, this, because of hijab. So that's when I was saying, you know, I started to question it. Um, I started to question wearing it. I'm like, well, wow, I did all of this, was trying to stay faithful and, and do what I could and then I get stopped. No matter the hardships they faced on the court, both held steadfast to their faith. I'm not going to abandon this. This is who I am. This is what I'm intending to do for the rest of my life. Though their time on the court is over, they continue to inspire people across the nation by sharing their stories. I don't speak to huge audiences, but the little people that I do speak to, I'm trying to get them to understand that we're humans. You know, we go through what you go through. We have the same hearts that you have. Both Bill Quis and Mahmoud plan to use public speaking as a platform to encourage acceptance of the Islamic faith. Bill Quis is currently working with FIBA to change its headgear rules. They are in a two-year trial period for allowing female players to wear head coverings that coincide with their religion. Keith and Brooke, back to you. Thank you, Jordan. That is such an inspiring story. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of WVU News. You can visit us online at our website. You can also watch any of our shows on YouTube, and please follow us and our reporters on Twitter. I'm Brooke Chaplin. And I'm Keith Willis. Thanks for watching WVU News. We'll see you next time.